We've had these incredible protests, all kinds of protests, protests every day. I think the challenge is how do we make our protests as strategic as possible to make them as effective as possible. The Biden administration made it clear over and over again that they were willing to pay the political cost of refusing to condition aid to Israel. The Trump administration is going to be even worse. With a bipartisan consensus against the Palestinians at the federal level, what do those of us who want to end Israel's slaughter do next? My name is Karee Pearson-Smith. Uh, I work at the Institute for Policy Studies, and my job is researching U.S. violence around the world and strategizing with activists to stop that violence. We find ourselves in a situation where the U.S. has been supporting this Israeli genocide in Gaza in front of the eyes of the whole world. It's a live stream genocide. We all know what's happening. We have been protesting in the streets, taking over campuses, um, just dissenting in all kinds of ways. And yet the U.S. is continuing the policy. Change in policy in terms of arms and, and so forth. No. And so I think that we are all confronted with the need to be more effective and deepen the effectiveness of our protest. I think we have to look at how the U.S. enables this genocide. And I think that we need to focus our protests really strategically on that. It's been extremely important that so many people in so many communities across the country got drawn into activity around this genocide and passed ceasefire resolutions and took other actions. And I think that we need to look at the fact that these weapons are made in our communities. These weapons are transported through our communities. And so building on the foundation that we have laid, you know, I mean, it took a lot of work to pass those ceasefire resolutions. It's really hard to do so um, in small towns and in big cities. So can't we now demand that our communities not be part of genocidal violence. Can't we pass ordinances, have protests, do direct action to say, we will, we refuse to have manufacturing of these kinds of weapons that are slaughtering, you know, people in Gaza made here. We refuse to allow these weapons to be shipped through here. Then we're not only confronting officials and saying, you don't have the right to do this in our names, we're actually undermining their ability to do this in our names. And that forces a different kind of conversation. So many of these weapons that Israel is using, that Israeli forces are using, are very complex and sophisticated weapons. For example, there's this aircraft, the F-35. This is a, an aircraft that takes parts that are manufactured all over the world, actually. I mean, part of this global movement against the genocide, one of the things that it has revealed is that there are facilities in Australia that make parts for the F-35. There are facilities in the UK that make parts for the F-35. And there are facilities all across the United States. So there are so many parts. My colleague at IPS here, Phyllis Bennis, talks about this, about how there's a strategy on the part of the military industrial complex to spread manufacturing out to almost every congressional district and therefore make each member of Congress invested in weapons manufacturing. And therefore, every time there's a bigger military budget, that means more jobs, right? Um, so that's been a strategy of the military industrial complex, but actually it's a weakness because it means that there's this really extensive assembly line. And if we can say in one city, hey, our city council's passed a resolution saying, we can't make these weapons here, or these weapons can't pass through here, or we are going to block a highway so that th this shipment can't make it to uh, an assembly plant to be to, to complete this weapon, then that really undermines their whole thing. You know, the fact that, that the assembly line is spread out all over uh, can be a problem for them if we organize ourselves strategically. The more I've been thinking about these big weapons manufacturers like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, General Dynamics, I've been thinking about them less as manufacturers and more as project managers because actually what they're doing is coordinating all these subcontractors. For those bombs, for example, um, there are these tail fins for, for bombs that they help steer the bombs or help make sure the bombs go in the direction that, that the bombers want them to go in. Uh, those are made in Illinois for bombs that are assembled in Arizona. And so there are all these different pieces of an assembly line. And again, that means that 
in our communities, we have the opportunity and really the responsibility to challenge that manufacturing. Palestinian Youth Movement just initiated this campaign against Maersk, uh, which is a shipping uh, company that we believe is shipping weapons. There's this company called Atlas Air, which is, um, they do air cargo shipping. There was a report in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz that showed that Atlas Air uh, aircraft have made many stops to an Israeli air base uh, since October, and there's reason to believe that they are one of the contractors that the Pentagon is using to fly uh, these weapons. There are corporations, uh, shipping companies, logistics companies that are part of the military industrial complex that are part of this violence. If we know that there's weapons manufacturing in our cities, I think that that provides clearer protest targets. And we've been trying to change this federal policy of supporting uh, of, send, of sending weapons to support this genocide. But there's also a question of local policy. I mean, like, our cities and towns and states host these weapons manufacturing facilities. They give tax breaks, in many cases, to these weapons makers. And so we want to also shift that policy, especially when we have a president in the White House who has been very... Um, very averse <laughs> to, to shifting at all, right? And so if we can make some shifts locally, that changes the whole situation that we're dealing with on a national level. Um, and that gives us new opportunities to actually stop this genocide. I think everybody feels this, that we are, we're entering just a new world <laughs> or a new phase in politics. That's true in the US and it's true globally. And Israel is intervening to shape this world and say, there's no such thing as civilians, actually. There is no distinction between civilians and combatants, if we say so. And so if we decide that hospitals can be military targets, then we're gonna do that. If we decide that schools and aid workers and journalists um, and medical workers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can be targets, we've decided that. Um, and that is the kind of world that they are working to shape. Uh, there has been at least an understanding, not always practiced, in fact, often not practiced, but there has been an understanding for several decades that there are protections uh, for civilians. People who uh, defend human rights in the International Court of Justice and at the UN and elsewhere have been able to stand on those protections. Israel's trying to undo them. We have to also intervene in shaping this world. It's crucial that we stand up for Gaza right now. Like we have to stop this killing that's happening in Gaza right now. And it's also the case that what is happening in Gaza is a test case about what kind of world we're going to live in. Like for Israel and for the United States, this is their test case to say that we can do whatever we want without restriction. And I think that for those of us who respect humanity, who respect life, you know, who want a just world, this has to be the place where it stops. We've been contesting in the political realm that is getting members of Congress to shift to supporting a ceasefire. We have been pushing the president. Um, we have been on the news, in the media, um, you know, forcing conversations on our campuses, et cetera, et cetera. There's a distinction between that world and then this kind of subterranean world that whatever the conversation is, this world of manufacturing and transport of weapons is humming along. Like these contracts have already been approved, as Biden um, says, you know, Congress and the State Department, the White House, they work like clockwork approving these weapons transfers. I want to know more about that. Like what is, what is that system that keeps the weapons flowing? Because that's what we have to target and that's what we have to dismantle. Central to how genocide like this has been able to operate, central to it has been that it operates in the shadows. It operates in the boardrooms. Um, it operates in our cities all around us, but rendered invisible. And they are afraid for it to be visible. Um, and so that leads me to say, let's shine a light on it. Let's make it as visible as possible. So I think we should take inspiration from the fact that they work so hard to hide it from us and do what we can to expose it and to challenge it and to stop it.